Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and today I am at the wheel of one of the most unusual Volkswagens you will ever see. Yes it's air cooled, yes it's a flat four, yes the engine's in the back but it's got four doors and it looks like an estate even though it's not actually an estate, it's a saloon without a boot at the back. Yeah this is the Volkswagen Type 4 and I pretty much guarantee you've not seen one if you live in the UK. Now. A quick word from our sponsors while you go hit like and please hit subscribe because we're trying to hit 100,000 subscribers before the end of the year which would be absolutely a magical thing if we could do that. So hit that button please. Word from the sponsors and then on with the review. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. So yes, this is the Volkswagen Type 4, the car that ran from 1968 to just 1974. And it's a curious thing. It's an attractive car, but not one that lasted very long because Volkswagen back in the end of the 60s was in a state of flux and to a certain extent panic because the Beetle had been their stalwart for so long and it had served them well, but the generations and the decades were changing and they needed something new and they weren't quite sure what was gonna happen yet. The Golf was still a way away and this car's successor, the Passat, was also a few years away. So what did they do? They made a four-door, bigger-engined, air-cooled Beetle, which is this. It's rather interesting, isn't it? Let's take a look around. So these were, in fact, Volkswagen's last ever air-cooled saloons and estates going out on a strong point you might say it's a beautiful late 60s smooth modern shape it really did evolve the beetle concept and the variant concept and the common gear concept to the modern day of the time they do look absolutely beautiful with sleek smooth front end and this lovely aerodynamic shape they're available as a two and a four door saloon and estate variant making it a very practical car despite the fact it has got the engine under the boot floor down here. At the time, Volkswagen's design director was a chap called Heinrich Nordhoff, but he isn't actually responsible for the design itself. That came from Pininfarina because Volkswagen had a bit of a, uh, a retainer going on with them at the time to come up with some curious and interesting ideas. A lot of those were for the Beetle replacement itself. Because as I say, they were throwing everything at the wall to find something new to move into the next generation at the time. Now here, at the pointy end, they were able to give us a big bluff front with a very smooth face because there is no radiator in here and no engine. There's actually 400 litres of boot space to take a look at underneath there. Quite a usable, spacious area for luggage. Which is really handy because although it looks like an estate car, when you get to the back of it, this rear end doesn't actually open. <laughs> it's only the 400 litres under the front boot bonnet. The back end, there is a big trough down there, but you have to access it over the back seats which I guess is why this was an evolutionary dead end. Now looking at the design of the doors themselves and the side of the car, it's very smooth, very clean. There's only a couple of design details, the swage lines, top, middle and bottom. And this interesting little curve around here, giving us a space to mount the mirror and let the air flow down the side of the car. Nice little recess for the door handles. In we get, and it's a lovely clunk as well. Very solid Volkswagen clunk as you shut that door. Climbing inside, First thing you notice is how much space there is because it is really, really big in here. And because the engine is at the back, there's no transmission tunnel, the floor is completely flat. And that goes for the front and the back of the car, just a small hump for strength in the car. So all three people across the back have got a nice floor to put their feet on for comfort. Climbing aboard, we've got typical 1960s design that there is body colour paintwork around the edge of this nice textured vinyl door card. We've got a solid door pull of interesting kind of chromy textured patterns to make the thing really feel quite interesting and uh, same pattern here on the door handle but not though on the manu manual window winder. Climbing aboard we've got big very big squishy padded vinyl seats with a perforated vinyl in there. No headrests but we have got seat belt belts climbing in and there's something else to notice we've got adjustment to move the seats back and forth which is normal we've also got adjustment to lift the seat up and down as well which is virtually unheard of 
in the uh, late 60s, unless you're going into very, very expensive territory. Now in here, we have got, starting at the top, an exemplary tea shelf area. So we've got plenty of room for snacks on the go up on top of this dashboard. Big ventilation blowing up on the window. These cars came with an herb spatula, a petrol heater as a, an option so that you could preheat the car even on a timer. You didn't have to be in the car to turn it on. Like on a Tesla today, you could walk out to your Volkswagen and find it was warmed up and demisted before you even got there. In the middle, we've got a little ashtray and a speaker for the very interesting looking radio. Love the uh, VW logos on the dials and of course the little chrome strips in here as well, all looking good. And we've got a grab handle for the passenger in case you start cornering a little too exuberantly on the way. Below that, we've got a uh, wood effect wrap over the dashboard panel itself. Uh, glove box on the left. And here we've got the pattern for our gearbox to tell us where to find the different gears. So we've got a 12 volt socket just here. Then we've got this little light here, which is a, a telltale to tell us that the herb spatula is glowing and doing its thing. Apparently it makes some interesting sounds when it's running. We've got a quite unusual windscreen wiper control just here. A rotating wiper control, which is unusual. A couple of blanked off ones couple of warnings and then we've got our pull out switch for the lights then back to the dials it's quite interesting though if you've got two big slots for the dials to happen the left hand one is an absolutely enormous clock and underneath it is a little tiny fuel gauge and to the right of that we have got our speedometer which goes up to 110 miles an hour i think the top speed's around 85 to 90 on these things it's a bit unclear doing research on these today um, but this car is also showing 80,000 miles, but this isn't the original speedometer. It's actually only done about 70,000, incredibly. Moving down, we have got quite an original and unusual feature in this car. We've got this little net area down here for stowing things underneath, which is great for sort of crash safety, because this will just crumple if you do have an accident. But at the same time, you can put all kinds of stuff down there, keep it safe, as well as in the big glove box. And it's quite an advance on things like the Beetle and the other air-cooled cars in the amount of ventilation we've got going on very very modern air vents here underneath the radio as well as the ones up on top of the dashboard just there now moving back we have now got a very big steering wheel it's leather wrapped tire it's leather wrapped and it's got the wolfsburg classic logo in the center as all the old volkswagens did a quick horn test oh that is a wolf in need of a schnitzel pop i would i would say just there I guess. <laughs> now moving back down, we've got tons of footroom because there is no intrusion in the center, although the wheel wells do intrude quite a long way actually into the your foot well from the left and right. We've got our VW badged pedals down the bottom, but you'll notice that like on an Italian car, I guess it is Pininfarina, we have got our offset pedals quite a long way because of this intrusion just here. Looking down here, we have got the gear lever, of course, we've got a handbrake, and we've got ventilation and choke controls down here as well. Let's have a quick look in the back and then explore the engine bay. Now climbing aboard the back, we've got a virtually the same door card, but with the addition of an ashtray down the bottom. As I said before, enormously flat floors. So you climb in, it's quite a nice big opening to let you in because it's such a big square door and a ton of headroom. So you climb in here, you've got loads of legroom, got loads of headroom. If you're a kid in the 70s, growing up in the back of one of these, you were absolutely spoiled. You've even got an armrest if there's just two of you in the back here. Plus you've got stowage in the back of the seat. As I mentioned, there is storage behind the seats, but you do have to access it by climbing over the top of the, uh, the seat in here. So it is useful, just not the most practical for visiting Ikea. But looking around the inside of this car, it is so incredibly light and airy with this massive, massive glass area all around you. Now, accessing the front boot, the fruit or the frunk, or whatever you want to call it, is a little tiny weenie lever hidden here in the glove box. So it does mean you can lock this up when you're leaving the car if you want the front secure. As I say, 400 litres of space in here apparently, which is quite a large amount. It's an interesting shape. It's a regular sized boot in the front and a little shallow boot above the fuel tank over to the back. You have though got intrusion of the wood lights. You got your jack just there and your washer stuff over here. It's an interesting space. And finally for front end amusement, you've got a small pull tag down here. Give that a tug. Whee! There's your fuel filler. Obviously a defining feature of this car 
is the engine being in the back. Glancing here at the back of the thing, we have got an air duct to give some ventilation. We also got Hofmeister kink going on. A little bit of BMW rivalry happening just there. But to get into the engine, we've got a tiny Winnie tag just here, which pops that. Well, we have got the back doors open. I should mention, we've got child locks in the back of this car as well, which is yet another really, really advanced feature of this thing. So this is 411L lifting up in here and you've got a ton of space. The Type 4 engine was really heavily reworked for this car. The idea being it gave more torque and a lower top of the engine itself. So it's set flatter to sit underneath boot floors. So in fact, they could have given it another boot in the back, unless there's an overheating problem I'm not aware of. This is designed to sit lower and flatter than the, the previous generations of flat four engines. Now there are two generations of this engine, but this is quite an interesting one because the cars initially came with a single car brasher and they wound up with fuel injection. This car though, the owner tells us, has got twin carburettors fitted, which is a one year only option, which I could find no information about whatsoever. Right, so it's an old fashioned static seat belt. So you have to adjust it on the bottom half, which is very unusual for some modern drivers to get useful. used to, sorry. That flat four starts up so easily. We've got our, we've got our crazy wiper switch. Interesting how they've not flipped the wipers from left-hand drive to right-hand drive. So you have quite a bad, as a triangle of some kind, I think. I forget the name exactly. And this thing just tootles away, tickles away from the line so smoothly. Incredible visibility all the way around. A pencil thin A and B pillars mean you can see absolutely everything around the car so, so well. We're pushing about 85 horsepower out of that flat four. So with uh, not a lot of weight, we can, we can get moving relatively well. Naught to 60 is 10.5 seconds. Hang on, that doesn't sound right. Checked notes. 15 seconds. So it's not a ball of fire. I can imagine with a family of four and a full set of luggage going off on holiday, it might be a fair bit slower as well. The gear shift has a slightly strange feel because it's linkaged all the way to the back of the car. And it's not vague. It just doesn't have that kind of real positive feel of clonking into gear like you do with a more direct gear change, but it's very, very easy to do. Reverse though, next time we stop, I'll show you reverse. That's a little bit weird. At least the wipers self-parked, that's quite nice. Yeah, it does just drop just lovely and smooth into there. And as air-cooled engines go, this does sound so lovely and smooth, it's really rather nice. If you're watching in the USA, this would have been sold to you as the Dasher rather than the Type 4 because you always got your own special names for some reason. Oh, where's my indicators down here on the right, left hand side of the column? Let's pop down here. The steering has a really interesting weight to it because there's no power assistance, but then there's virtually no weight at the front of the car either. So even at low parking speeds, it's not too heavy to, to crank the wheel around. But as you get up to, we're doing 30 miles an hour at the moment, and uh, suddenly it has become an awful lot lighter feeling. Quite, not alarmingly light, just, just very, very light. Right, I'm not going to do a to 60 but a hard pull if you like. Yeah, that flat four thrum. It's interesting handling. You can feel the thing pushing from the back. It's not vague as you might imagine it to be, but it does have a certain amount of shimmy and wobble from the front of the car. So reverse is quite a tricky one. You have to push down and sideways to the left and then it kind of goes in without much notice of what's gone on. 
Right, so the Type 4 engine, which is buzzing way behind us, is quite an interesting thing in its own right. Because it lived on in a second life almost after this car. So first of all, it was developed as an over-square design to give a bit more torque out of the same kind of capacity. Initially it was 1679ccs with a single carburetor and it made just under 80 horsepower. From 1973 into 74 for the final year of production it was enlarged to 1795cc, gradually rising from 80 to 85 horsepower over time. And the engine lived on for quite a long time, it was in production until about 1983 being used in, uh, in the van series of, of Volkswagens, but also it wound up in the Porsche 914 as well. And this was a very, very advanced car. They were, despite the fact it was still an air-cooled flat four, they were stirring everything they could at it to make it as more advanced as possible. It's a monocoque unibody construction. It's got McPherson struts suspension at the front, trailing arms at the back, discs at the front, drums at the back. It's got a hydraulic clutch, so it's a really easy gear change. And in fact, a lot of this suspension and that kind of thing was carried over for the Super Beetle when that continued in a, uh, yet another generation of the Beetle. It also has 45-55 weight distribution incredibly, despite the engine being slung right out at the back of the car. Now they were very popular cars around the world, about 350,000 of these things, give or take, were built, which is it's fairly good numbers for that, that time period and not a real volume car. It is a volume car, but not in the same volume as, say, the Beetle itself. However, here in the UK, it was never a big seller, mostly down to price, because though Volkswagens were popular, import duty priced this thing really out of its own market. It was pushed up to the same kind of price as a Vauxhall Ventura, a Rover 2000, a Triumph 2000. Um, so it, it was priced as very much a premium car. And although it is a very well built car and people who bought Volkswagens prized the reliability and the build quality of them, which was well earned by VW and well deserved, they didn't come with the same kind of level of appointment as the more expensive cars, unfortunately. Now, this particular car has been with its same owner for many, many, many years. Uh, it's had it fully restored at one point. It lived out in Cyprus, I believe, for a few years as well, so it's had a quite an interesting life. But he has finally decided to part company with it, and it's actually for sale on Car and Classic at the moment. So if you're interested in driving home in your own Type 4, which is going to be something, which is an opportunity you don't get that many of, then yeah, hit the website now. That suspension does give it quite a weighty feel through a corner. A lot of stability, more than you might imagine for a rear engine car. This really is the perfect car for someone who loves their Beetle but has now got a growing family and still wants that air-cooled VW fix. But space for all the family. But it's a very easy car to drive very smoothly. What a fun, fun car to be in. I really like this. And the owner tells me that he literally never goes anywhere without being stared at and a couple of people stopping to ask what it is and I can really understand why. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this rarest of rarities. It is such an unusual car and I'm really quite honoured to have driven it today. So if you like this, please like, subscribe. Join me again next time driving something completely different.